if you go to an allopathic doctor, you get asked certain types of questions about your symptoms. Questions that help the doctor to figure out where you fall within the doctor's range of expertise. If you go to a homeopathic doctor, you get a different set of questions. Go to a Chinese doctor, a different set. Ayurvedic, a different set. And it depends on which of these systems you've grown up with. The questions in that system will seem most natural to you, the sort of things you learn to observe about yourself. In other words, you start internalizing the way they look at your body and look at your disease, and other ways of looking at disease will seem strange. Now, the question, of course, always is, is that way of looking at your body or your disease really the most helpful? Or is it simply a way of fitting you within their system as a way of maintaining their system? You hear the history of allopathic medicine and how they squeezed out everybody else. They were the only ones who were not quacks. And as a result, we've missed out on a lot of alternatives. Or you look into psychiatry, psychotherapy. A certain case would come to a exorcist in Thailand, and the exorcist would immediately say, oh, spirit possession. The same case would come to a psychiatrist here in the States, and they'd say, oh, schizophrenia. So which is it? Which is the most effective way of curing the disease? And there's always that question, are you being best served by these different systems, or are you just being treated as more grist for their mill? This is one of the areas in which the Buddha's teachings are really special. When the Buddha talks about suffering, he says he teaches suffering and the end of suffering. But he doesn't really define suffering that clearly. He gives examples. And they're pretty broad. Not getting what you want, having to stay with what you don't like, being separated from what you do like. And you can interpret those in all sorts of ways. And the cure he advises is not one that he's going to impose on you. It's one that you have to administer yourself, which gives you a little bit more confidence. You're not there for the sake of the institution. I mean, there have, of course, been Buddhist institutions that have developed around ways of defining your problem for you. The whole Tibetan Book of the Dead or the, the Sutra of the Ten Kings in China, where they tell you you've got to watch out for your dead ancestors because at this stage after their death they're going to go to this court or they're going to go through this stage and you've got to pay the monks or the nuns to do the proper chants to make sure that they get through the stage. I mean, it's obviously there for the sake of the institution. But if you take the, the original teachings, you realize that you're totally free to take them or not. And the definition of your suffering is something that you provide for yourself when you start out with. As you practice, you'll find that your sense of what suffering is and how you're going to comprehend it will grow a lot more subtle. But it grows more subtle because you're getting more familiar with it. And so to preserve the original intention, it's our responsibility as individuals to take charge of our own practice, our own cure. And the Buddha gives pointers of where to look. You look at where your cravings are. You look at where your ignorance is. You look at where your clingings are, all of which are very difficult things to see. and very difficult things to 
let go of, especially in the case of the clinging. You have a certain sense of your own identity, the things you like, the things you don't like, the things you're willing to put up with, the things you won't put up with, the things you will look at and the things you refuse to look at. And it takes a lot of honesty to overcome those obstacles. And it helps to have someone who's been on the path before you to keep you honest. This is why when the Buddha was teaching Rahula to look at his actions in terms of his intentions, the immediate results, the long-term results. He said, if you notice that you did something that caused harm, go and talk it over with somebody else who's already on the path. So you get the benefit of their insight. I'm going to talk to the Galamas, where he said not to go simply by what your teacher says or by what the texts say or by your own sense of what seems right or seems, doesn't seem right. You've got to test things in, in practice to see what act, types of actions actually give results that are skillful and which ones give results that are not. And you have to take into consideration the opinions of the wise. So you don't have to reinvent the Dharma wheel every time you act. And you do have a situation where you can take advantage of other people's outside perspective, because it's a lot easier for other people to see your defilements than it is for you to see your own. And for those who have gone further on the path, it's a lot easier to see the types of defilements that everybody else in society takes for granted. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha often had his students go to different parts of India from where they had grown up. The culture would be different and they'd give a different perspective on the things they usually took for granted. I know this is one of the major advantages of my going to Thailand. Some of the values I took for granted, some of the activities and attitudes I took for granted, I suddenly discovered were questioned over there and viewed with a certain amount of suspicion and a certain amount of skepticism. And it was good to have that outside perspective. But I still had to do the work on my own, as a John Fuang once said. This is what he meant by that when he said, you have to think like a thief. Don't expect that the teacher is going to hand everything to you. You have to try to figure things out for yourself. That doesn't mean just figuring out what the teachings are, but also figuring out where your own defilements are, figuring out how you play tricks on yourself, how you hide things from yourself. You're the joint that has to be cased. And if you're willing to take on that responsibility, okay, then the training is possible. The teacher is here to provide perspective, to help suggest op opportunities or suggest approaches that you might not have thought of on your own, or you might have thought of only after a long time. But the basic work on administering the cure is your work. It requires a lot of honesty, it requires a lot of patience. All the qualities that make you a reliable person. So instead of simply presenting yourself to the doctor and asking for the cure, you start taking charge of your own cure. And the role of the teacher is to keep watch, to notice when you're getting off course. As a John Cha said, and he sees people wandering off the right side of the road, so he says, go left, go left. Other people wander off the left side of the road, and he says, go right, go right. So it's not a matter of simply copying down the teacher's teachings and then putting them in a book and taking them as his approach to the Dharma or his basic teaching. The teachings have to be taken in context, and the context is your own sense that you've had enough suffering, however you feel burdened, and you want to put an end to it. Now, this may take you a lot farther and require a lot more from you than you originally might have imagined. 
But as you get on the path, you realize that that's where you want to go. Again, nobody forces you to stay there on the path. If you decide at a certain point you want to leave, that's your choice. Again, we're trying to preserve your freedom all the way through. But with freedom comes responsibility. And that strong sense that if you don't follow the path, if you don't take care of your own mind, there's going to be suffering, which is not a point that some institution is trying to use to threaten you. It's some fact of life. They talk in postmodern terms about how everything is determined by language. Well, pain is not determined by language. The way you interpret the pain, the way you may un understand how it's caused may be determined by language. But the fact of the pain is always there. It's prior to language. And it's the reality that keeps impinging on whatever ideas we have about ourselves, whatever structures we build for our own self-identity or our idea of where we fit in the world, or how the world fits around us. And the goal that the Buddha proposes is something also that's beyond language. He says one of the things you realize when you come to the end of suffering is that you know how far language goes and you know what goes beyond language. So it's not just a structure that we're trying to impose on you to keep you in the structure. This is a, this is a structure that's designed to get you out of the structure. And it deals with problems that come prior to the structure. It's not that the disease is defined by the, the ability of the doctor to treat you. It's designed by your own sense of being burdened. So keep these points in mind as you practice. The teacher is there to give pointers. help get perspective, to call you on things that you need to learn. But basically you're the one who has to decide whether you're going to take the teacher's advice. And you're the one who has to decide if you're really serious about putting an end to suffering. So again, there's freedom, but with the freedom comes a lot of responsibility. This is something you always have to keep in mind.